He's gushing blood. <laughs> All right, listen to me. Is this in private house? Yes, it is. All right, now, listen. Do you want to wait? Listen to me. Yes. I'm sending you an ambulance. Okay. I want you to take a clean towel. Yes. Wrap wherever he's gushing blood from. Okay. Hold pressure on it. Okay. Lay him down. Hello, true crimers. This is the case known as the Bella Terra murders. Viewer discretion is advised. Real quick before we get started, as usual, hello, I'm Mike. If you're new to the channel, I tell three true crime stories a week here on YouTube, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I also tell short form true crime stories pretty much every day over on TikTok, where I have around 3 million followers or so. So if you'd like to see that, the link should be up here at some point in the beginning and also at the end, but it's also in the description of this video, including in the link tree. I have a Discord server if you want to join it, be over the age of 18 if you're going to do so, or else you'll be kicked out of there. I sell merch, we ship all over the world, the entirety of the world, except some of the oceans we don't ship to. And then lastly, if there is a case you want me to cover, just email me, Mikey at TrueCrimeRR.com. That is listed below in the description. Just send me the name of the individual, where it happened, when it happened, and I can add it to my list. There's about 5,300 names or so on there. I pick my cases at random. I will get to the case you recommend eventually. I just can't tell you when. But let's get into today's video. Come on, Vogue. No, stop it. Okay. This story took place in Long Island, New York, I guess in the Bella Terra neighborhood. It was supposed to be the first day of senior year for 17-year-old Martin Tancliffe. But instead of going to school that morning, he woke up to an absolute nightmare scenario. Shortly after waking up, he makes this 911 call. All right, hold on and I'll connect you. I'm connecting you with the ambulance. Fire escape, 10cliff had been brutally murdered inside their home. Martin Tancliffe had been born 17 years prior, but his birth mother would give him up for adoption. She, I guess, already had a child and apparently she could not handle a second one. Three days after he was born, he was adopted by a couple from Long Island, New York, Seymour and Arlene Tancliffe. And Martin was pretty much then immediately um, in, in a very good life. Seymour and Arlene, along with a business partner, Jerry Stewerman, they owned a, a very successful bagel store. Therefore, his parents were quite wealthy and they lived in this really beautiful ranch style home. Martin basically got everything he ever wanted and everything he ever needed. He had an all-terrain vehicle. He had whatever current gizmos and gadgets any, you know, young teenager would would need and want. He had it. Years prior at his uh, bat mitzvah, there, they said there were clowns, there were game booths. The entire uh, hall that this, was being, this party was being thrown in looked like a bazaar. His parents went all out, and because they could. By all accounts, he was close with his parents. He would go everywhere with them. If his parents were at a business dinner, you know, uh, he would join them because 
it sounded like Seymour and Martin, Marty, were basically the plan was for Martin to take over the business should and when that situation, you know, happen. Martin would go to all of the business meetings and take in all of the knowledge. But it, apparently it wasn't all sunshine and butterflies. There were, there was tension between Marty and his parents and other relatives. Martin and Seymour would argue a lot, uh, especially when it came to Martin's future. Seymour was really saying to, to, to Martin, you know, you need to go to college. I know we have this big business, this enterprise, and you're going to take over it one day, but you still need to go to college. But Martin said, I don't need to do that. I can just begin helping you in the business. And then when it's time, I can take over the business. There's no need for college. There were some tensions between Seymour and Arlene. Apparently four years prior to this case happening, Seymour and Arlene had split apart and were separated for a little bit of time, but then they got back together, they reconciled. But according to a lot of friends and family, they didn't reconcile completely, but there were still issues and, you know, some cracks here and there, but that's, I'm sure that's just marriage. That's just how it works. I believe, from what I understand, Arlene and uh, Seymour had a daughter prior, like their own daughter um, that, you know, Arlene gave birth to before they had adopted Martin. But the dynamic overall of the family was just your kind, I mean, it was a typical family amplified by the fact that they had money and, and Martin seemed to kind of, you know, at times gloat and brag about the things he had, the things he could get because of the money, kind of, you know, irritated some kids at school, but he was never like ever viewed at as like a monster or this evil person or anything like that. So this takes us to the evening of September 6th, 1988. Seymour is hosting a card or poker party um, in his home, in his office. He has like, you know, a nice, you know, big poker table. By all accounts, everything went great. They had fun at this, you know, poker game. But apparently discussions came up amongst this group of friends that Seymour was wanting to take a trip to the Atlantic City area to take a break from the tensions between he and Arlene and the tensions between he and Marty and just to kind of get away. He even asked one of his friends at this poker game, hey, do, would you come with me? just for a couple of days, just to get away. And the friend's like, okay. But that would never get to happen because then it was the very early morning hours of September 7th, 1988, when that phone call I played earlier was made. 53-year-old Arlene Tancliffe was bludgeoned and stabbed next to her bed in the master bedroom. 62-year-old Seymour was initially, according to Marty, found sitting in his office chair, kind of just slumped, and he had been bludgeoned and stabbed as well, but he was still alive. So according to Marty, who again is 17 years old, he wakes up early that morning, the house seems quiet, he is walking around, he's looking for his parents, and initially he can't find anything. He looks into his parents' rooms, kind of glazes in there, and doesn't see anything. Doesn't see anything in the kitchen, doesn't see anything in the living room, the family room, doesn't see them anywhere. Then he goes to his dad's office uh, slash his poker room, and that's when he sees his father, his 62-year-old dad, slumped in his office chair. And at first he's like, is he, is he sleeping? But no, he realizes there's just blood everywhere. There's blood all over the ground, there's blood all over his dad. And so he like freaks out and he kind of runs looking for his mom. And that's when he goes back to his parents' bedroom and he takes a peek around the bed. And that's when he sees his mom on the ground, covered in blood, throat's been cut. She looks like she's been beat. She is already deceased. He apparently then goes back to his dad where he claims that he takes his dad out of the chair and tries to do something to save him. Um, and, and in the process, he gets blood all over him. Police arrive at 6.17 a.m. and they, at that point, canvas off the area. Martin was supposed to be going to school. I mean, this was his first day of his senior year and he would never even get to experience that day, let alone his entire senior year. When the police arrived, uh, Martin was out in the driveway screaming, somebody killed my parents, somebody murdered them. Like he was distraught, he was upset, he was screaming, he was crying, like he seemed very legitimately in terror about what the hell happened. And he immediately tells police that he knows who did this. He says it was Jerry Sewerman. 
Jerry was the self-described bagel king of Long Island. He was the business partner to Seymour. He was described as this flamboyant, self-promoting, charismatic, just sort of kind of douchey guy. <laughs> he like flashed this big gold bagel like necklace around his neck. He was very flashy. He was all about the money. He was all about flaunting it. He came into Seymour and Arlene's life back in 1983. So they became quick friends and then they became quick business partners. Jerry, uh, who at that point was in a shit ton of debt, borrowed $500,000 from Seymour and Arlene. So then there would be a lot of tension between Jerry and especially Seymour. Jerry had connections to career criminals, especially those involved in like racketeering and that kind of thing. He was also involved with the Hells Angels. I guess he was connected to them too. And Jerry was there at that poker game that the night before the murders happened. The poker game, according to all of the players involved, ended at three o'clock in the morning. And when, I, when everyone left, basically the last person said that the last person that was there with Seymour was Jerry. And that's exactly where Seymour was found. He was found in the room where the poker game was happening. At that time, Jerry still owed a massive amount of money to Seymour. And the documents that even showed that and proved that were literally next to Seymour's body. When Marty told police, I, I think this was clearly Jerry Stewerman who did this, obviously. Uh, literally a day and a half after the murders took place, Jerry Stewerman faked his own death, threw on an elaborate disguise, and fled the state. He fled all the way to California, literally across the entire country. But he was spotted by so many people, and so it, they quickly learned what he did. And the, the detectives went and literally retrieved him from California and brought him back to Long Island. But Jerry was like, listen, I just did that because I thought you guys would consider me a suspect. So I just, I just fled. Hi, there's your guy. Like, but these detectives were like, don't worry. We don't even think you did it. We don't, we don't, there's no, what? There's no connection here. We, we know you're a good guy. We know you wouldn't do this. So you're not even in trouble, bud. Literally, I'm not even joking. They didn't consider him a suspect, even though Marty said, listen, this guy is a suspect, even though they had evidence that Jerry owed Seymour and Arlene a shit ton of money. And uh, basically, they also found out that Jerry wanted to franchise out the bagel company kind of without Seymour, but sort of still using Seymour, and Seymour didn't like that. So there's there's just motive galore for this. It's just like, bing, 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 there's your guy, obvious suspect. But police are like, no, we just don't see it. We don't see it at all. So we're not even gonna, we're not even gonna interrogate him. We're not even gonna bring him in for questioning. So you're good, Jerry. What? Police look through the house and first like, okay, this is a million dollar home, lots of valuables, lots of money. These are rich people. This is clearly a robbery gone wrong. But then they found really nothing was stolen. There was a ton of money in the house still, a lot of valuables, you know, jewelry, that kind of thing. None of it was taken. Now, according to Marty as well, when he woke up, before he discovered the bodies, he noticed that the front door to the house was wide open, uh, just just plain as day wide open. There's no way of confirming that because when police arrived, he was already outside, so he could have left the house, but the door was still open when they got there. So they had no way of verifying that, but it did lead some kind of, you know, okay, this is where the person who killed them came in and left. By the way, I should also note that at this point, you know, from day one, Seymour was still alive and he was in the hospital being treated. However, he was in a coma. And so police noticed there was like um, blood on like near light switches. There was blood in kind of various little places around the house. And they're asking Marty like, how come there's, there's blood around? I mean, you said you turned on the lights, so, and there's blood near the light switch. And he was trying to explain to them. He's like, yeah, because 
I took my dad off the chair and I tried to like save him. I was trying to like do whatever I could to save him and I got blood on me. And so I went to, you know, when I got up to call 911 and all, all that, yeah, my bloody hands got everywhere. Which makes sense. I mean, you're, he's handling a bloodied body. Of course, he's got blood on him and there'll be blood everywhere. But <laughs> the detectives were still like, I don't know, kid. This isn't sounding right to us. Like, you could tell they were already beginning to just hone in on this 17-year-old kid as being their suspect. Even though he has told them an actual viable suspect in Jerry Stewerman, the guy who owed a fudge ton of money, the guy who then later fled the fucking state and faked his death, they still were like, no, there's no evidence that he did this. But you, Marty, you were in the house. Hi, so was Jerry. I also need to note that at this time, this is in Suffolk County, and there was currently, at that time, an investigation by the State Investigation Commission, the SIC, into the Suffolk County Police Department because there were a number of allegations of corruption within this police department. Not only that, there were allegations of detectives basically coaxing false confessions or forcing false confessions out of suspects. The lead detective in this case had literally been reprimanded for perjuring himself on the stand in a, in a previous criminal investigation. There was so much bad in this police department, but they brought in Marty for interrogation, not Jerry. They brought Marty in and they talked to him for like five, six, seven hours and just constantly berated him with, we think you did this. We know you did this. Why did you do this? And he's like, I didn't kill my parents. And then hours later, they come back into the interrogation room and they tell Marty, the 17 year old distraught, emotionally unstable child as, as of, because of his parents being murdered, or one of his parents being murdered, one of them almost murdered, they tell him, they come back and say, guess what, Marty? Your dad's out of his coma. He uh, said it was you. He said you did this. And so Marty was like, what? I didn't, do maybe I blacked out. Maybe I blacked out and I did this. I don't remember doing this, but my dad says I did it. He's this impressionable 17 year old kid who was just told that his own father pointed the finger at him. The problem, it wasn't true. The detectives lied, which they're allowed to do. They are allowed to do that, unfortunately, because Seymour never woke up from his coma. As a matter of fact, a couple of days after this, he died. Uh, so he was now a second murder victim but he never once regained consciousness. He never told a police officer that it was his son. But because police lied to Marty, Marty being this kid who doesn't really know a lot, he basically kind of inadvertently confesses saying, I get, I, 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 what am I supposed to do? He said, I did it. I guess I must don't remember it, but I did it. And so the detectives write out a confession and they say, all right, Marty, sign it. He doesn't sign it. As a matter of fact, he looks at it and goes, no, I'm not signing this and I'm recanting all of this. I didn't do this, I didn't do this. So here's how police were gonna basically try to prove that Marty was the killer. Because Marty said he had touched his dad's body, which is why he, that he had blood, which is why it was blood over the, all over the house. But Marty says he like rinsed his you know hands off because that's what had bloods on, them, on it in the sink, in the bathroom. But police believe that the amount of blood that was shed because of all of this brutal stabbing and bludgeoning, he would have been covered in blood. He would have had blood all over his clothing. He didn't. When they got there, he wasn't drenched in blood and his hands and everything was clean. So they're like, okay, Marty, clearly you took a, uh, a very long shower. You rinsed off all of this blood. All of this blood should be down the drain, the pipes of your, of your shower and your sink. We got you, bud. So they took out the pipes. They took out the, the traps, right? Of all the sinks and everything in the house. And they, they, they swabbed every square inch of that stuff to find blood. And they were like, yep, we're gonna find blood in there. Boom, proves that you showered off after you murdered both your parents. Guess what? They didn't find a drop. 
Not a single drop of blood was in any of those pipes, meaning that if he was severely bloodied and he showered to get all the blood off of him. So yeah, no blood at all. Not, not any substantial amount of blood to prove that he cleaned his bloody body off. So they're like, well, <clears throat> They still think he did it, so... We're gonna charge you with two counts of murder now, bud, because we have no physical evidence. Uh, we don't have... We don't really know what the murder weapon is. We don't have it. We don't have anything pointing to you physically. We don't have a goddamn thing saying you did this. But we have our gut feeling you did this. So you're being charged with murder, kid. His uh, confession, uh, which he did recant, was still allowed in evidence. And it was literally the only evidence they had. That was it. Just his confession that he didn't sign, that he recanted. So they go on trial. They bring up witnesses to talk about the relationship between Marty and his parents. They even have Jerry Stewerman take the stand. Um, the guy that some people, including Marty and pretty much most of the family, uh, and smart people think actually ki killed the couple. Uh, they let him testify at the trial. It's interesting. And Marty is convicted. He is he is convicted of the murder of his parents. He is sentenced to 50 years to life. And <laughs> Marty is just immediately breaks down the moment he is, says they say guilty. He just completely breaks down, and starts crying right there in court, and he is hauled off to the prison he will be in for the rest of his life, more than likely. But Marty knew he was innocent, as did a bunch of his relatives, including family members, direct family members of, you know, blood relatives of Seymour and Arlene. They were there in defense of Marty. Like, he didn't do this. Jerry did it, obviously. So they got a bunch of lawyers, retired lawyers, retired detectives. They uh, got a whole bunch of experts to work on his case. They, they get this like uh, highly recommended private investigator who used to be a New York City homicide detective. They get him to really dig into this. And everywhere he goes, every turn he takes, every piece of evidence, every witness statement, everything points to Jerry Stewerman. None of it pointed to Marty. None of it. He found out that Jerry Stewerman sold cocaine out of the bagel stores. He was doing this side gig, this drug enterprise out of the bagel stores. And he was doing so with his son. And then over the course of the next, you know, a decade or so, the son had an enforcer, I guess, or I don't know, a hired goon, where this hired goon literally was bragging that he got away with participating in the Tancliffe murders. They, this detective then looked through and found out that this enforcer had a fudge ton of arrests before the murders and after the murders. They found a close friend of this enforcer. I'm not sure what this enforcer's name is. He hasn't been named, to my knowledge. They found a, a close friend of him, and they this close friend actually admitted to being the getaway driver during the night of the Tankleff murders. The, the the driver would sign an affidavit saying, yeah, I was the, I was that, that's what I did. So now they're trying to overturn the conviction. They're trying to get a new trial based on this new evidence, this new testimony, these new suspects. Again, none of the evidence pointing to Marty, all of it pointing and centering around Jerry Stewerman. And at that time, the then current district attorney of Suffolk County should have recused himself. Why? Five years before the murders of the Tankliffs, that district attorney was a lawyer who had literally been the representation for Jerry Stewerman's son during uh, drug trials, during like cocaine tr trials that the son was going through. And remember how I said that the Suffolk County Department, Police Department was going through an, a big investigation with regards to corruption and cover-ups and coerced confessions, the detective who essentially coerced the confession out of a 17-year-old kid, he was represented by the now district attorney, 
uh, back then during the corruption hearings and all of that. And this current, this now current district attorney, his old law partner represented back in the day, Jerry Stewerman. So there is a massive amount of conflict of interest that this now DA has in this case when it came to, you know, possibly uh, getting a new trial or overturning the conviction altogether. But he wouldn't recuse himself. As a matter of fact, there was evidence that Jerry Sewerman was really close with and friends with the lead detective in this case. The lead detective didn't even arrive at the crime scene until like a full 20, 25 minutes after everybody else. And he was the one who said, no, Jerry Stewerman is not a suspect. He was the one who helped collect Jerry from California after he flooded and said, hey, don't worry, bud. You're not a suspect. You're good. So as they're trying to, they're basically now having a hearing to just basically decide whether or not you know, Marty Tankloff is going to get a new trial or what the case may be. Well, this DA is now accused of, because he hasn't recused himself, he's now accused of uh, witness intimidation. He is discrediting every single piece of new evidence and new testimony that comes into play. And even though it, it's it, at the very least, you now have a massive amount of reasonable doubt, still the judge during this hearing, during this appeal hearing, he agrees with this district attorney who absolutely should not have been the district attorney on this case. He says, I agree with him. This is done. Marty's still in prison. Bye. And this, by the way, is now in like 2004 or five or six, something like that, in the very early 2000s. And then uh, by 2007, he has still not given up, Marty. He is still determined that I did not do this. And so he then goes to the appellate division of the Supreme Court of New York. He now has not only the help and the backing of all of the relatives and the previous lawyers and detectives, he also has uh, the Innocence Project on his side, some very high profile organizations and very high profile people. And this included 31 previous prosecutors who were on Marty's side saying, it's clear he didn't do this. The National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers all supported Marty in this endeavor to overturn this conviction or at the very least get a new trial with all of this new evidence about this hired goon, this cocaine deals being done out of the bagel store, the money that was owed to, you know, to uh, Seymour by Jerry, all of this that pointed to Jerry and his circle of being involved in this, so much support now Marty had by 2007. It was unbelievable. His story was covered on 48 Hours, and now you have millions upon millions of people who are looking at this going, wow, this is some insane injustice. Like, this kid was put in prison for something. It's pretty clear he likely didn't do. And, you know, they had interviewed uh, very impartial people, like, you know, just sort of, they, they interviewed and showed the evidence to some judges, to some attorneys, defense attorneys, and prosecutors, and even they all agreed, like, listen, he deserves a new trial. I mean, this is ridiculous. On December 21st, 2007, the appellate court decided to completely vacate the conviction of Martin Tancliffe, and they ordered a retrial to happen immediately. They said, quote, let me read this, it is abhorrent to our sense of justice and fair play to countenance the possibility that someone innocent of a crime may be incarcerated or otherwise punished for a crime which he or she did not commit. Just seven days after this is announced that he's, he's ordered to get a new trial, the New York State Investigation, the SIC, the committee who was investigating them, you know, the Suffolk County Police Department way back when this happened, well, they're now reinvestigating that same department with the players involved back then for corruption when it came to this specific case. On June 30th, 2008, the then Attorney General, Andrew Cuomo, he would announce that the prosecutors will not be pursuing another trial against Marty Tankliffe, citing that there was insufficient physical and circumstantial evidence to even present this at a trial, that essentially there was no evidence 
to properly convict Marty Tancliffe. On July 22nd, 2008, the New York State Supreme Court, they completely dismissed every single charge against Martin Tancliffe for the murders and anything involved in the murders of Seymour and Arlene Tancliffe. He was now an innocent man. The probably very corrupt detectives, sorry, not sorry, uh, who handled this case, his name was Detective James McCready. Uh, he passed away on January 14th, 2016. I don't know if he ever really faced any actual repercussions for his actions. Unbelievably, Gerald Jerry Sewerman, uh, where all of this evidence really pointed and, and clicked back to him and his Possibly his son, his son's acquaintances, these individuals involved with dealing cocaine out of the bagel shop. All of it was so, so much that pointed to their guilt. Um, unbelievably, he has never been arrested in connection with the murders of Seymour and Arlene. As a matter of fact, nobody has. There has not been a single charge laid on anyone with regards to this double homicide. Why? I'm not sure. Uh, there is no statute of limitations on murder, so I don't know why they haven't pursued charges. I mean, if they were comfortable pursuing charges and taking it to trial with no evidence whatsoever against Marty Tankliffe, why can't you bring a trial or charges against someone where there is actual evidence? Even if it's not physical evidence, I mean, you may not have, same thing with Marty, you may not have the physical DNA, fingerprints, anything like that to connect to Jerry or any other person possibly involved. Sure. Okay. I get that. But you do have witness accounts of people stating who did this and who was involved in this. You have people saying, I was the getaway driver. I was there. You have people, the people saying, I was there. I drove the car. I drove the murderers away from the house. It's no charges. It's, I don't know why. I don't know why. Marty Tancliffe spent around 18 years in prison for a murder he did not commit. He didn't commit it. He didn't kill his parents. Someone else did. We all know who did. We all know who either did it or hired the people to do it. We know. So you have this 18 years of injustice against one person, and then you have 18 more years, or actually, as of right now, 2023, you have 35 years of injustice for Seymour and Arlene. They are, their killer hasn't been caught. Their killer hasn't been charged. Their killer hasn't faced the music. Nothing. Marty filed a lawsuit against the state of New York for the wrongful conviction in which there was a settlement made of $3.3 million dollars. And then he would go on to, I guess, file a suit against Suffolk County directly. Uh, and during that lawsuit, uh, when McCready, Detective McCready was still alive, he would have to testify at this lawsuit. And he testified, he goes, I don't, Jerry who? Jerry Stewerman? No, I don't know who that is. Never met him. Bitch, you, you were the one to literally capture him in California and brought him back to New York. That was you. Now you're saying you've never even met him? didn't know him. Jesus. Jerry Stewerman testified actually at this, uh, this lawsuit and he took the fifth amendment 150 times during his deposition. <clears throat> so in the lawsuit against Suffolk County, Marty Tankliffe won an extra $18 million. And one of the biggest reasons why you do this is to make sure they are held accountable in some way, shape, or form for their horrific behavior. Did any of those people go to jail or face any kind of legal repercussions in terms of like charges? No. Kind of the cool thing is that Marty Martin Tankliffe uh, would graduate from uh, the Toro Law Center in 2014, and he is now himself an attorney. Ultimately, he was still wronged and his parents were murdered and no one's ever faced charges for it. And that's awful. Normally I would sit here and say, if you have information about you know the case, please contact, but I don't think it would do anything. I really don't. I think they know, they have all the information they need. They have all the testimony and the evidence and they're just not doing anything about it. And so at this point, the murders of Seymour and Arlene Tankliffe 
will probably just forever go unsolved and no one will probably ever face any repercussions for the actions of those murderers. But sadly, that's the end of this case, true crime, a Rooney Dooney Dingleberry Dongs. Hope you found it interesting, if not also very frustrating. Uh, but yeah, like I said at the beginning, please subscribe to this channel if you like true crime. Give this video a like so it gets pushed out to more people. Follow me over on TikTok. All the socials are linked in the link tree in the description of this video below. Now, I want to finish this video by telling you my story. In West Philadelphia, born and raised, on a playground is where I spent the majority of my days. When I got in one little fight and my mom got 